is wonderful to be here again. Now, there are some family problems that I want you to help me avoid. And I know some of you will understand what I mean. Uh, I have a daughter, Elena, a sister, Deborah, a niece, Aaliyah, and a wonderful wife, Wanda. And I think if I don't come back with y'all having related to Aaron Patrice Mumford, the way you related to Jordan A. Harris, I'm gonna have a problem in my black family. <laughs> so what is the name of the sister seated at the end of the row? Erin Patrice Mumford. All right, and periodically you will be tested during the course of the day, but it's to help me out. Now there is one other potential family problem I want you to head off for me. Um, uh, my wife is actually a new wife. Uh, we've been married 20 months and most of you know Wanda, I think. And so you can imagine my distress when this morning as we sit here listening to folks we respect, and first I hear, close the candy store. I've been married 20 months. And then, and Wanda's a lawyer, I hear Judge Mathis say the brothers are getting too much love. Now I know it's in context, but I'm concerned about those, so if you should see Wanda walking through the halls, I want you to stop and say, Wanda, leave that candy store open. <laughs> I wonder if you remember the last words that Bishop Curtis said just a couple of minutes ago. We are one, profound. I'm sorry, Bishop Curtis, forget the evening. I was so focused on what he said. We are one. That's a profound notion. And Brother Naeem Akbar began to advance that this morning. But I think we need to test it along the way to see if there are some potential outcasts, some who may be on the margins of the black family, some who may not be tethered so tightly to the rest of us. And some of those involve some tough questions. Um, one of which we will get to, because it was one of the emails from before, but we're not going to start on gay marriage, because that's the kind of question that can hijack the rest of the day, but we'll get there. But we are going to talk about a host of challenging questions. Now, you heard Tavis use the word conversation, and I like to think that's the result of an ongoing conversation that he and Tom and I have been having. You know that the black rhetorical tradition is about speeches. And each one of these folks up here, as the folks this morning on the panel, could hold us spellbound for two and a half hours by themselves, each one. And so the challenge that Tavis has laid on me, and he shouldered himself this morning, is to persuade them to have a conversation as though we'd wandered into their home, into their kitchen, and sat and talked to them. Some of them respond to that persuasion differently than others. But what we try to do is ask them each to give us an opening idea in the context of that conversation. And what I've encouraged them to do is to sort of make eye contact with me and jump in at any point along the way so that we really do have a conversation. As I thought about where to start, even in the context of talking about outcasts, the thing that struck me the most this morning, and I don't want to make comparisons because it was a profound morning just to sit there, Maybe the quietest speaker, Dr. Patterson, talked about loneliness. And when I think about something as deep as that, the name Ayanla Van Zandt as a person to minister to that came to mind. And so the question that I thought we might start this afternoon, and Dr. Patterson talked about the fact that surveys suggest that for black folks, we think we have smaller networks of friends we can call on in a time of need. That we tend to put off marrying later and we get divorced more often and sometimes we don't marry at all in shockingly large numbers, suggesting that despite the fact that we have a powerful sense of community in a place like this, he says we tend to be lonely. So maybe the first potential outcast in the black family to start with is ourselves. What's the prescription? country are antidepressants. Sixty-four percent of them are African Americans. There's probably an even larger number of us who need antidepressants who don't go and get them. I mean, a little medication ain't hurt nobody. The thing that when we talk about loneliness, when we talk about suppressed anger, when we talk about suppressed rage, 
when we talk about um, the shame and the guilt that has been cast upon our community as a whole and individuals. This is the baggage, and we all make jokes about the baggage, but this is the baggage that we bring to relationships. There are generational patterns, generational issues. I sometimes call it genetic coding, things that go on that we carry from one generation to the other because there really is not an honest, authentic dialogue. We talk around stuff, we never speak to it. We talk uh, about what we may want, we never talk about what's really going on. I think some people are in families and in communities, in relationships, and they are lonely. They're afraid to be who they are taking a little bit of love rather than risk losing the love that's not satisfying them at all. Yeah. Taking a little bit, reaching for the crumbs. I think we're lonely because we accommodate lack. We accommodate lack in the bed, lack in the house, lack in the bank account, lack in everything that we do. Mm. I think we're lonely because we don't have a strong no. And when you don't have a strong no, you got a very weak yes. So we're saying yes to stuff that we don't want and we don't have the courage to say no to the things that are going on in our life. We have weak boundaries and all of this we bring to the table of relationships, of building families. We're lonely because we're separate, separate by a codependent theology, separate from God. God is over here and I'm over here. God is in when I'm in trouble, but when I got a check and somebody's loving me, God is in the closet. So yeah, we are lonely. We're lonely because we're off purpose. We're lonely because we're out of order. We're lonely because we are codependent on things that are temporal and physical. What to do is the question. We need skills. Yeah. We have been conditioned, programmed, and taught to be dysfunctional. Yeah. Right. Dysfunctional. We need skills. And those skills have to be taught in the home. Simple skills. Simple skills. I'm going to 1 Corinthians 10. Love is kind and patient. Do we know how to be kind and patient? Love does not boast. It keeps no records of wrong. We got people right in this room that are not speaking to members of their family because they're keeping a record of wrong. We got to put that stuff down. Love endures. We walk away from relationships with leave the children, the dog, the china, and a whole bunch of bills because we don't know how to endure not having our way, not feeling heard. Not knowing how to ask for what we do, what to do was the question. The question is, learn the skills, effective communication skills. What to do, make every person in the family feel welcome. What to do, lay down your wrongs. Everybody in this room has somebody they need to forgive in their family. Mm. What to do, open our minds and our hearts. What to do, find a way, find a way to reconnect yourself with the God of your understanding so that there is a spiritual authority and a level of accountability in your life. Yeah. Dr. Gwynn, let me stay over in that corner of the room. Uh, again. Let me stay over in your corner of the room. And Ayanla mentioned skills, and we've had a lot of fun with sex, uh, talking about sex today. And the question is, are there skills in, I mean, but this is also, I assume, a serious subject. The question of, in the context of a relationship between two people, are there skills in making sexuality a positive part of that relationship, and are those skills something that can be taught, or do you either have them in your genes or you don't? Oh yes, it must be taught. I, I'm always teaching it. I taught it on The View with Barbara Walters and Star Jones. They asked me to come on television and talk about when do you talk to children about human sexuality? And I said, you talk to children, and by the way, I'm Ethelie's daughter. That didn't touch you? Well, Ethelie was from Alabama, and I'm her dream walking. And that's a testimony to black mothers, amen. But anyway, I was on The View and said, 
talk to me about when you talk to children about human sexuality. And I said, you talk to the child when you're changing his diaper. <laughs> if he touches his genitals, you will call it, if it is, a penis. You will not call it a titi, a wee-wee, or a nini. <laughs> Information, Jawanza Kanjufu said to me, I thought you said you were gonna be good. I lied. <laughs> See, I am your advice columnist. Somebody say, before. before. There was a Dr. Phil. There was, there was Dr. Gwen. There was Dr. And I'm still teaching you through that column between us how to live better. Somebody say, live better. Live better. I get your secrets. You tell me things you don't even tell each other because you write to me anonymously. And so in those letters, women say to me, why do I keep selecting the same man over and over again? In my book, The Best Kind of Loving, I call it same man, different body syndrome. <laughs> I said, you keep selecting the same man because you're the same woman. <laughs> and, and you didn't read my book. <laughs> the best kind of loving. Be careful who you take your advice from. Let me give my testimony. Somebody say testimony. testimony. I've been married to one black man over 40 years. is not a statement, that's a testimony. Do I hear an A woman? A woman. One of the things, one of the things we've got to do is we've got to reconnect to what I call the golden rule. Say golden rule. Golden rule. The golden rule of relationships. Yes? Here it is, right from my book, The Best Kind of Loving. Friendship first. Friendship first. Lovers second. Lovers second. Honesty always. Honesty always. One of the things, one of the things we've got to do is go back and make it personal. Somebody say make it personal. Make it personal. We've been talking about all these problems, but we didn't make it personal. Yes? So you've got to make it personal. You've got to make it personal with these brothers in prison and bring them into the family and stop focusing on romantic relationships. We're talking about family relationships. Let me give you my story as I close. I decided when I saw that story about Hurricane, I need to testify about my story. I used to have a radio show and I worried about the fact that we have two million black men, no, two million people in prison. And most of them, over 50% of them, are black men. And I decided to make the problem personal. And so I did time with a black man in prison. I did 10 years with him. Somebody say 10 years. I allowed him to call my home. He got in college courses while he was in prison. When he got out of prison, he registered for a law school. He was accepted into law school. He graduated from law school, high up in his class from a prestigious law school. And now this young man is an attorney. So my, my message, my message is Susan's message. It's a message of love. We gotta bring everybody back into the family circle so that the circle will be unbroken. unbroken. Dr. Ben Carson, this morning as we sat listening to the panel, and I hope I haven't break, broken any confidences, uh, a couple of times you turned to me and said, we gotta talk about the mental health of young black men. What was on your mind? Why were you saying that? Well, unfortunately, as you know, the fastest growing industry in the United States is the prison industry. And who's in those prisons but our young black men? And, you know, we've all heard it said that the young black male in America is an endangered species. Why do we say that? Because there are more young black males in jail than there are in college because the homicide rates in our major cities are astronomical for young black men. 
And this is a huge problem. And yet, any of us who are in educational fields realize that they don't start out that way. Yes. Our young black men, our young black boys, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, they're just as eager to learn as everybody else. They're good, they're cooperative. And then as time goes on, they get into the higher grades and that peer pressure begins to kick in. It becomes important to be cool. They start reading about this great nation of ours in their history book. And that American history book doesn't have very many people in it that looks like them who really made any significant contribution. And they say, well, maybe next year when I take world history, and the same thing happens, and everybody wants to know, where do I fit in? Where are my ancestors in this? And then they come home and they turn the TV on. There I am, playing basketball, baseball, football, rapping in those baggy pants, acting a fool on some sitcom. And you begin to develop an image of success that does not include being a nuclear physicist or a CEO of a major corporation. <laughs> So he begins to neglect that educational component, thinking he's going to be the next Michael Jordan or you know, the next rap singer. And unfortunately, the statistics don't bear out for him. No one tells him what statistics are. Seven in one million will be a starter in the NBA. They don't tell him that less than 1% of people who go to college on an athletic scholarship end up playing professional sports. Most of them don't graduate at all. That the average income uh, five years after their career is over is less than $20,000 a year because they haven't developed this. I wish they had a program on television that came on every day called Lifestyles of the Formerly Rich and Famous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that our young men will have an opportunity to see this. Well, anyway, now they've neglected all their studies. They're not going to be a sports star or an entertainer. What's left? Up drives this big black Mercedes with tinted glass, out steps this tall guy with furs and jewels and women. Want to be like me? I can show you how to get all this stuff. Besides that, the society sold you a bill of goods. They owe you. The next thing you know, you're looking at TV. You're saying, isn't that little Johnny? Being led off in handcuffs trying to shield his face, having committed some heinous crime. What happened? What happened indeed? What happened was what happens every single day across this country. And it's something that we can stop. Because anybody, regardless of your ethnicity, could take taken little Johnny by the hand when he was six years old and walk down the streets of Miami and given him a black history lesson he would have never forgotten. They could have started by pointing to his shoes and saying it was Jan Motzlig, a black man, who invented the automatic shoe lasting machine, which revolutionized the shoe industry throughout the world. Yeah. And they step on that clean street, you can tell them it was Charles Brooks, a black man who, who invented the street sweeper, those machines with the big brush. And down that street comes one of those big refrigerated tractor trailer trucks, Frederick Jones, a black man invented the refrigeration system system for trucks, airplanes, boats, all kinds of things. That truck comes to a stop at the red light. You tell them it was Garrett Morgan, a black man yes. who invented the traffic signal. And while you're talking about Garrett Morgan, how we invented the gas mask, saved lots of lives during the war. And while you're talking about the war, Henrietta Bradbury, a black woman who invented the underwater cannon, made it possible to launch torpedoes from submarines. And you see a beautiful black woman walking down the street. A black man did not invent her, but... <laughs> 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 we can use this opportunity to talk about Madam C.J. Walker, a black woman who invented cosmetic products for women of dark complexion, was the first woman of any nationality in the United States to become a millionaire on her own efforts. And you'll walk past the hospital. You can talk about Charles Drew and his contributions to blood banking, understanding of the function of blood plasma. Daniel Hale Williams, the first successful open, open heart, heart surgery, surgery in the world, had an operative mortality rate less than 1.5%, better than many cardiothoracic surgeons today. You look up at the surgical Light Thomas Edison. You didn't know he was black, did you? <laughs> they say it's only one drop. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> now, 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 he wasn't. But his right-hand man, Louis Latimer, was black. Right. And you can tell him how Louis Latimer came up with the filament that made the light bulb work for more than 
two or three days, how we invented the electric lamp, did pioneering work in incandescent and fluorescent lighting diagram, the telephone for Alexander Graham Bell, was a tremendous inventor in his own right. Most people never even heard of him. You walk past the railroad tracks, Andrew Beard, the automatic railroad car coupler, spurred on the Industrial Revolution. Elijah McCoy had so many great inventions, like the automatic lubrication system for locomotives. You know, when a new thing would come out, people would say, is that a McCoy? Is that Is the real the McCoy? McCoy? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you got racist people talking about the real McCoy. They don't even know who they're paying homage to. So, and, and, and I'm barely scratching the surface. And why so, would you be telling me? And, and because you want them to understand that they are an imminent part of this nation, that they have paid their dues. and. And it is important not only for them to know that, but it's important for white America to know that too. They need, we need to all understand that when we look around, wherever we are, on the street or in a building, there are black people who invented things that made all of our lives more convenient. But even more importantly than that, we need to understand that I can take that same walk down the street for virtually any nationality. And I can point out all kinds of tremendous contributions that were made. And that's how the United States of America got to be number one faster than any other nation in the history of the world. Our diversity is not a problem. It is a strength. And it is small-minded people who have made it into a problem. And we need to make sure that our young people understand that they should be committed to the well-being of this nation. And all of our ancestors came here in different boats, but we're all in the same boat now. And if part of the boat sinks, the rest of it goes down, too. So we need to make sure that we teach them that they are part of this and that they can be successful in this country. And if you make yourself valuable, an interesting thing occurs. People need you. And when people need you, they pay you, and you do well, and you make a contribution to society. And that should be our overriding desire. We are made in the image of God. God does not care what color you are. God cares what your heart is like. Dr. Dr. Dillon. Joe Andrew Kunjufu wants to respond or add on. Yeah, there's, there's just so much I want to reinforce what Dr. Carson just said. One, uh, is there a relationship between special education and prison? 